In this fixed gear question and answer session, we'll talk about my thoughts on fixed gear conversions, the pros and cons of big and small cogs while keeping the same gear ratio, and how I deal with biking in the heat, plus more, coming up. What's up? I'm Zach Gallardo. Life is short, but don't make it shorter, so ride your bike every day to be reasonably dangerous. Be sure to subscribe for more fixed gear videos just like this one every Thursday and Saturday afternoons. And of course, all the parts that we'll be talking about today are linked in the description. Feel free to check those out at any point during this video. Are conversions worth the hassle instead of buying a new fixed gear? Have you ever converted a bike? And how many fixie points will I lose if I ride one? Judging by your phrasing, are they worth the hassle? In that case, I would say no. If you view converting a bike as a hassle instead of a fun project, you probably just want to get on a fix here and start riding. There are some things mechanically that you have to do with conversions that you don't have to do with regular fix gears. I personally have never converted a bike. I am not one who enjoys working and all the mechanics. So I actually just enjoy buying complete fix gears, riding them and upgrading them as I go. And as for fixie points, you'll probably lose at least 10. Thoughts on your first bike, the Motobicon Track. So back in 2012, I bought a Motobicon Track for a grand total of $280. I first came from my brother's giant bowery that I was just riding around. And so when I got onto this steel Motobicon track, I was thinking, this feels a little bit more dead to me. It just felt a little more squishy and that when I tried to sprint, I didn't get the same input feeling that I got from a stiff aluminum bike with Sugino 75s. And at the time I didn't know that was the difference between steel and aluminum, but that steel springy feeling did eventually grow on me. And while it wasn't an excellent bike, it was good enough. I replaced the cranks with Omniums, which did help a lot with the ride quality while sprinting. And the wheels, I really dislike loose ball bearing wheels. I remember when I was working on them because they were super crunchy, I ended up damaging the dust cap that goes on top, which defeated the whole purpose. It was a fine bike. It was a fine bike. Is it realistic to work a delivery job with a fixed gear? First of all, is your terrain? Are there huge hills where you are? If there are, then a fixed gear might not be the best tool for making delivery jobs where it's really important to get from point A to point B super quickly. Secondly, what's your level of fitness? There are some people that can pull it off in even super hilly areas, but a lot of messengers slash delivery riders, they ride fixed gears because of the simplicity and it gets the job done. But there are some companies that do required gear bikes for you to work for them. So yeah, it's totally realistic. I'm doing 100 miles on my fixed gear. What's your best advice? Have to ask because everyone else thinks I'm crazy for doing it. First of all, don't listen to the people that think you're crazy for doing it and don't listen to those people that think you can't do it. And the best thing that you can do to successfully complete a century on a fixed gear is to prepare very well. First of all, plan fun into your ride. Your ride is supposed to be a challenge, but at the same time, you're supposed to enjoy doing it. What will help that is knowing the route like the back of your hands and really nail down the best route that you can possibly do and know it without ever having to look at it when you set out for your ride. Bring food and a lot of water for your ride. And on that same token, plan out your breaks. Treat yourself out, go eat something that you really like, be conservative with your breaks and take a lot of them and take your time on them. Rest is just as important as the actual riding when you're doing a century on a fixed gear. And lastly, go somewhere that you're excited to go. Make the destination count. It's not just about riding a hundred miles. It's about enjoying yourself. Is there a downside to using a smaller cog like a 14 tooth with a 42 chain ring instead of getting a larger chain ring if money is not a concern? On the same note, why isn't it more common to see the smaller cogs like 14 teeth? You don't really see a lot of small chain ring with small cog combinations to achieve the same gear ratio. If you think about it, there's less teeth and less chain links for the wear to go around. And because of that, you can argue that bigger cogs and bigger chain rings do result in a smoother running drivetrain. The disadvantage though with bigger parts is that they're bigger, so they're heavier. And if you are doing some off-roading, clearance might be an issue. So bigger is generally longer lasting and smoother running. Of course, there is a point of diminishing returns. So that's why you mostly see 15, 16, 17 tooth cogs with the appropriate chain ring. I'm looking for a good toe clip and strap setup. Just wondering if there was one that you think 
someone absolutely must try. There's no toe clip strap setup that I've tried that have been absolutely life-changing, but if money were no object for me, I would go with MKS GR10s because they have a wide platform which is more comfortable for me, but at the same time, they are tapered towards the front so you can still take corners aggressively without having to worry about pedal strike. And I would go with the all city nylon double toe clips because I've snapped a bunch of steel and aluminum toe clips. And for toe straps, hands down, Toshi double straps are the best that money can buy. They don't make these anymore, so they will be pretty hard to find. They're made of laminated leather, so they'll last really long and they won't slip. And also double straps, look pretty cool in my eyes. JR10s, all city nylon double cages, Toshi double straps. Solid, solid setup. Speaking of a setup that somebody absolutely must try, if you're interested and you like this design, feel free to check out these reasonably dangerous sunny tees at the link in the description. These are a limited run t-shirt. The last printing of these shirts will be on August 30th. They are made to order, so there won't be any more after August 30th. So if you like the design, you can get it in either this white or on a black shirt, and you can check that out at the bonfire link in the description. How can you stop knee pain while riding fixed? If you're getting injured just while riding your bike, something is wrong. And usually if your knees are hurting, your gear ratio is too big for the terrain that you're riding. If that's not the case, if you're riding clipless, that may also cause knee pain, and you might want to look into switching over from clipless to straps and clips. But if you want to stay on clipless, something that is nice for knees are time attack pedals. These are my favorite. They have a lot of float and they're easy on the knees. And lastly, of course, you should probably do this first, is see a doctor. Have you ever been tempted to go back to a traditional geared bike? Nope, fixed gear is my favorite type of riding. I really like the connected feeling. I like the simplicity. I like the reliability. And right now I live where it's completely flat. I don't need gears. And even when I would benefit from gears, one of my favorite things is climbing on a fixed gear because I like the extra challenge and that sense of accomplishment when you do finally get to the top. I'm a beginner fixed rider and I want to get to velodrome riding and crit racing. Would you recommend an aluminum frame with budget parts or a steel frame with mid-range components? Your question implies that a quality aluminum frame set costs more than a quality steel frame set. And while that is generally true, you can still get a really good race-ready aluminum frame set for about the same cost as a budget steel frame set. The one that comes to mind for me is the Dolan Precursor. For around $350 in the US, you get a 7075 triple-butted aluminum frame frame set with a carbon aluminum fork and it includes a headset and a seat post. And the Dolan Precursor of course has track geometry which makes it track legal of course. If you compare that to something like the Pocket Rum Runner that you mentioned, it costs about the same. With the Pocket, the frame set is like 200 bucks, a fork is like $100, and a headset would be $50 plus installation. So an entry level but quality aluminum frame set costs the same as an entry level but quality steel frame set. For racing, I would definitely go with aluminum because it's stiffer and has better power transfer than steel. So I say, Aluminum frame set with mid-range components for velodrome and crit racing. How do you get into riding in Central Valley heat? For those of you who don't know, I live in Sacramento. That's the Central Valley. It's summer here. We regularly get triple digit Fahrenheit temperatures. And I don't really commit to riding in the heat because it makes riding a little bit less fun for me. So instead, I like to do most of my riding in the morning or in the evenings. I normally wake up at 4.30 and do my riding in the very early morning because it's really nice to watch the sunrise when there's no cars out on the road. I like the quietness of the morning. And with the wording of your question, when you say commit to riding, it makes riding sound like a chore which I never treat my riding as. I think of my riding as I get to ride my bike instead of I have to ride my bike. If I'm feeling cooped up, riding my bike is a great way to make me feel better regardless of what the weather is. Although I might have to get over that initial hump of maybe I don't want to ride because it's 110 degrees, but whenever I do push myself through and I'm not feeling great, I usually feel a lot better once I get back from my ride. What's your favorite part of the Wobby frame set would you recommend it to a beginner? I'm assuming that you're referring to the Wobby Retro, which I built up a couple weeks back, and you can watch the video up here. With all the Wobbies I've ridden, my favorite thing is the ride quality. It's just really springy and lively. It feels like the bike is encouraging you to keep riding and to go faster. My second favorite thing, of course, with the Retro slash Special, the lugs 
I am a sucker for lugged bikes, and they're pretty clean with the decals, so that's just my style. Whether it's good for a beginner, if you can afford one, and if you think you'll ride it enough to justify that price, it is definitely a great bike for a beginner since you don't need to upgrade anything. Usually with beginners, I recommend to try out a cheaper bike so they don't have to sink a bunch of money into a hobby that they might not like in the long run. But if you think that you'll like cycling, by all means, the Wabi is a great choice. Again, feel free to check out this limited edition t-shirt well, there won't be any more after August 30th at the link in the description. And you can also check out all the components and the parts that we talked about in today's video in the description as well. And Fixie Famous shoutouts to Mikey Sincox, Otzi Verto, Connor Kerrigan, Albert Wu, Marek Dravecki, Robert Terpstra, Blue Tick Hound, Dorella Zero One, Evil Erty, Mark Van Deventer, and Jazeel for making these fixed gear videos possible through their support on Patreon. If you haven't ridden your bike yet today, stop watching me right now and go out and ride your bike because life short, but don't make it shorter so ride your bike every day to be reasonably dangerous.